um, systems that, um, that are available, like uh, Paxos-based systems, Zookeeper, um, but they don't have very good throughput. And so one of the things that Spaper, I think, is trying to do is figure out what you can trade away in order to get better throughput from the system as a whole. Um, interestingly, though, the place they start from isn't just starting to trade things away and, and make the thing. Uh, um, they don't just give up things. They actually add something. That's the, the first um, sort of idea they come up with. That if you add a, uh, an additional invariant as well as the transactional uh, invariant, if you if you require that there be a global transaction or there be no consistent agrees on, um, that actually provides quite a lot of value. We'll see see that a little more. And some of the other ideas, um, I'm not going to go through all these, but just if you read the papers, you might recognize some of these or maybe not. Um, I just sort of wanted to you know, throw them out there at the beginning. I think there's a lot of really different ideas that combine into the papers, and that was one thing that was interesting to me. It wasn't just a single innovation and a lot of things that work together. Um, so before getting too much into details, just, just so that you don't think Colin is the be all and end all of everything, things are. There are trade-offs, and it's, it's good for some workloads, like for LTP, small transactions, simple CRUD kinds of operations, and um, um, it's intended for a high throughput system, high volume system. Um, and of course, as I said before, you want to be able to do transactions across partitions, and hopefully across a, a wide uh, network with a lot of latency between the, um, the nodes. Um, but there are some things to watch out for. If you have a lot of variability, or if you just have high latency in, in your disk I.O., um, you have less flexibility in reordering transactions. So that can actually be a bigger problem for Calvin than for some other systems. Um, availability, that's actually one of the, that's really going to be the price that you pay. It's, there's more, more points of failure, more ways that it can fail than, than for instance, in Zookeeper. Um, you can't really deal with large read sets within a transaction. You can't do consistent reads where you just you know, read through everything at a certain, uh, like an MVCC kind of read. Um, there's also a, a, some difficulty with complex transactions. It's not that you can't do them, but it requires breaking them up, and then you're more vulnerable to contention. So if you have a system which has a lot of complex transactions, you might have to think twice about using something like Calvin. Um, I'll talk a little more about dependent transactions later. Um, OK, so there's definitely going to be trade-offs, but let's just look at some of the, the details. Here. OK, so a little uh, notation just to make this all go smoother. Um, this R1N1, I'm using that to represent a, a node in a replica. So um, a replica, you can also think of R meaning region. So it's like the replica is going to contain every partition of your system um, distributed perhaps on several nodes. So it, within replica, within node one of replica one, you might have some of the tables, and the rest of the tables are on node two of replica one. And you have exactly the same pattern mirrored over here in the second replica. So each, each replica has, its, has a completely um, separate <coughs> pipeline of components. The first one is called the sequencer. Um, that's where the actual ingestion of the transactions happen. So when the clients in the real world submit a transaction request, the first thing it goes to is the sequencer. Well, it's not quite the first thing. There's actually a little sort of pre-processing step that sometimes has to happen. But um, that's really where, where the uh, system takes hold of the incoming stream of transactions. Um, so let's now focus just on one of these, uh, one of these nodes. Um, so we have the client-generated requests coming into the sequencer. Um, what, this, uh, what the sequencer does is it has a clock. And every 10 milliseconds, it chops up the incoming sequence of transactions and um, forms it into batches. So two transactions come in in the first 10 milliseconds. Let's call that epoch one. And we will assign a globally unique ID that specifies the, the node and the epoch number. And so after the 10 milliseconds have elapsed, uh, we've got these two transactions. We're going to write them to a log, which I'll describe in a minute. Um, and the key that we're going to store, store it at is that unique ID. OK, so what is this log? 
Um, a few slides ago, there was a list of like, ideas in Calvin. Uh, there was something saying uh, replicate inputs rather than results. Um, replicate transaction inputs rather than results. So the log is what does that. It replicates the transaction inputs. Um, it has to be a distributed key value store. That's how we're, we're using it. Uh, it has to be replicated across our system. Every node has to be able to access it directly. It can be an eventually consistent system. Um, it just matters. It's just important that, that, that these batches of data eventually get to each node. And it has to be suitable for high volume because the, the values associated with each key, of course, are full transaction batches. Um, so uh, a natural choice would be Cassandra, um, Dynamo, React, all the more would be alternatives. OK, so let's, let's look at the picture of, of all of the, the nodes in our little system, two nodes in each replicant, uh, assembling these batches. So they each, like, 10 milliseconds elapse, collect a batch, um, and eventually the log will contain the full set of batches. Um, oh, is there a way to make that thing go away? Ah. Ah. Uh, view? Nope, sorry, no. What do I do? Some view. Yeah. I don't know if this means. View, 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 view. view. And full screen. Does this work? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. great. Great, thanks. Um, so all of the, the batch IDs show up eventually, but it might, it's an eventually consistent system. They might arrive at different orders on different, different nodes. Uh, we can't really control that. So what do we do about that? Um, so at some point, we might see that, that um, these, these two IDs have shown up, and they each have a sequence of transactions in them. How do you merge those two sequences? How do you decide, do you do the R1 ones first, and then the R2 transactions, or the other way around? Um, now you might say, well, why don't we just arbitrarily always do the replica one transactions first. These are the, the transactions that arrived at node one of replica one. Why don't we just always order them first and then order the replica two ones after that? Um, well, the problem is maybe replica one is down and you're only working with replica two. Um, maybe there are three replicas and um, one of the replicas can't actually see another one, and so you can't tell whether there are, whether R1 even exists. So they're not going to decide on the same ordering. They're not going to be able to see the same um, set of replicas. So um, instead of trying to mess with that, we really have to get a consensus here about what order we're going to, to put those, those in. Um, and, and note that at the moment, we're only looking at the node one uh, in each replica. The, the other dimension here is actually easier to deal with, and we'll look at that in a minute. Um, so what we use for that is something like Zookeeper. To, to order the, the batches of requests. Um, so again, this is, this is also a distributed key value store. Um, it's replicated on, on each node across our system. This one has to be sequentially consistent so that every, um, every append to that that we make to that list of um, transactions is seen in the same way in every, in every node in the system. Every time we, sorry, I should go back here to say that. Every time we decide that this guy is going to be followed by that guy, everybody has to see that ordering in the same way. So we're going to assemble a, a log of all of these batch IDs. Um, so we need sequential consistency for that. Um, it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to handle high volumes because the keys are just the, the IDs. Um, sorry, the, the, um, the values are just the IDs. Um, so we'll uh, leave Zookeeper for that. Um, so, uh, so what does this do for us? Um, within a replication group, so that means that that's the uh, sort of the dimension cutting across the geographical, geographical dimension. So it's node one and replica one, node one and replica two, and so on. Um, they come to an agreement using the consensus as on a linear ordering, such as that, and then the batch that we end up with is just the, uh, the two batches merged in that order. And, and note that the, the arrival times at 
a particular node are preserved. Um, what about batches from different replication groups within um, within the same replica? So uh, in that case, um, we can just merge them in static order because we we pretty much uh, um, we're pretty much going to have to have all of those um, in order to make progress anyway. You can't do without N2. Um, so, so we can just statically decide that N1 comes before N2. So whenever we see a batch of, of uh, N1 of, of, of transactions arriving at N1 and a batch of transactions arriving at N2, uh, we just order them in, in that way because um, we statically know that there's always going to be an N1 that's always going to be an N2. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this a little more later, that Calvin really just can't make progress if all of your N2 nodes go down anyway, so um, you could just make that static assumption. Um, so at that point, the, the sequencer has completed the work it needs to do for that first epoch, the first 10 milliseconds of time. Um, uh, so what has it done? It's, it's taken a batch of requests from each um, sequencer and replicated it across our system. Um, each batch is now accessible by the GUID from anywhere in our system as soon as it's been propagated, which may take a little while. Um, the GUIDs have been entered into the meta log, establishing an order that everybody agrees on. That ordering has been replicated to all nodes, and using that ordering, we can now everybody can now see the transactions in exactly the same one. So after this point, that's all that we ever need to do consensus on. So we haven't executed any transactions yet, but we've completely finished with any need for consensus. So that's actually a, a kind of a cool thing about Calvin. Um, okay, so um, now that we've sort of finished this, the, the first uh, steps, um, we can sort of work entirely within a node. After this point, Almost everything we do is going to be local to a node with just a little bit of light coordination with the other nodes. Um, and that light coordination is far less than two-phase commit, but we'll see more about that. Um, so what does a node have to do? Well, it's, we've given it this nice ordering of transactions that everybody sees in the same order. So it has to consume those transactions. It has to execute them on some local storage system. It has to do so with concurrency. We can't just say, run T1 until T1 finishes, and then run T2 until T2 finishes, because then we're just sort of wasting a lot of time. So we have to find a way to do this concurrently. And we have to preserve the basic invariant that's so important to the whole system, the, the, um, the deterministic ordering of transactions. Um, or, or the, we have to preserve the invariant that the state of any node is as if the transactions had been executed in that deterministic order. Even if we do some fudging with concurrency, even if we, in some cases, reorder transactions, we still have to preserve that invariant. OK, so I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Um, so. Uh, Can you say that again? I mean, I don't know if you want questions now or later. Please, please, whenever please. I was doing this, it was like, OK, I understand why you would want to maybe do the coordination before a transaction starts going. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a lot of pieces, and the pieces are like, ah, all over the place, and it seems to be like, like kind of Whatever. Like I can, I can buy the fact that it's just like if we do work ahead, then the transaction goes faster. Then you have this replication layer, and you think that order is thing, and an invariant has to be held. Well, it wouldn't be an invariant if it's not like if it's not like held by everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's like we get a replica. I get something there. So like the assurances that I have is that whatever my replica receives is going to be like executed in the same order or not, but then they, they switch it. Like, I mean, it's like, well, it should be executed, and then like, there's like room for this. It's like, yeah. either it is, or it's not, or why if it's not, is it because like the way that you process them has already been pre, pre, like, picked out? That's down. part of it, yeah. It, it has to do with the lock manager. OK. And um, there, are, there are more constraints in how we can move things around in Calvin mm -hmm. than how you can do it in two-phase commit. In two-phase commit, basically, you can do anything you want because there's there's no sense of an ordering that everybody agrees on anyway. So you might as well, in uh, two-phase commit, all you have to do is be equivalent to some serial order. Nobody says what serial order. But here we have a serial order given, and we can translate that serial order into a sequence of lock acquisitions. 
And using that sequence of lock acquisitions, that's how we can obtain some concurrency, and we can even reorder transactions if it helps us. So I'll actually have some diagrams. I'll explain that a little better. But I'm guessing you have to have something about the data and stuff in order for the internal dependence. Totally. 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 That's, that is actually sort of one of the Achilles heels of Calvin. That's why you can't have these long chains of dependent operations within a transaction. Um, it's very dependent on being able to get the read sets and the write sets in advance. And you know that before you've even started executing it. Yeah, so um, and that's also why it's best to use Calvin for very simple transactions, just you know, CRUD type stuff. Um, so, yeah, good point. I'll come back to that in the next slide. Um, so, a little structure of what's inside of OneNote. Uh, the scheduler is sort of the main piece. Uh, there's just one of those. It talks to a lock manager. Um, I'll say more about that in a minute. And then there's also these. This is where we're going to get the concurrency. Depending on how many threads you want, each thread has a, uh, an executor module and a readcaster module. All well, these could be different threads, I suppose. Um, and the readcaster, um, it's broadcasting read results to other readcasters in our Calvin system. And this is the only coordination that we're going to see. It's the only node-to-node -node communication for the rest of this whole thing. Um, after we got that bit of consensus uh, with the, uh, the metal log. Oh, and yeah, um, below this line, none of these guys know anything about the locks. All the locking is going to happen up on the top there. I think the next slide, yeah, the next slide is about locking. Um, uh, so the lock manager, it's, um, it's, not, uh, it's not a physical lock. It doesn't lock pages. It doesn't lock anything on the disk. It's, um, it's a logical uh, lock manager, so it, it manages read and write locks on particular rows. Um, it only has to lock the rows that are actually stored on the, the, the node that it's living on. So, um, and that's, that's defined by, by N1. Um, N1 might be like one table and N2 is one other table. Well, the lock manager on N1 then only has to lock the rows in that one table. That's going to be enough to preserve determinism because uh, as far as this node, as far as the state of this node, is, is uh, going to evolve, it, it isn't going to depend on um, uh, the state of, of the other node. I mean, you, you can just lock um, the rows in this node. Sorry, I don't know very well. Um, um, OK, but in order to preserve the determinism, actually, the lock manager itself has an invariance. We're, we're going to translate the, the big invariant of the whole system into an invariant that applies just to the lock manager. And it's, it's fairly obvious why this, this should be that um, if we want the system to execute in an order equivalent to the deterministic T1, T2, T3, then the lock manager had better make sure that if T1 comes before T2 in the, the ordering and they both touch some row, then when T1 is granted a lock on the row, uh, that must happen before T2 is granted a lock on the row. And then, of course, it must release the lock before T2. Takes the lock. So the locks are granted and released in the same sequence that the locks that, that the transactions show up in the meta lock. Um, and so yeah, I mean this this is a um, uh, but it's really important here that this is only uh, at the level of the row. So um, it doesn't restrict uh, how the locks are granted if T1 accesses some row that T2 doesn't care about. Well, I'm not sure how important that is. Um, okay, so uh, oh, let's just take a little side trip here and talk about um, the effect of this on, on the contention footprint. Um, so when are we holding these locks? We're going to hold these locks around the, uh, the work that the executor does. And what the executor is doing is reading and writing from the disk. And it's also um, the readcaster is reading and writing from the network. So the lock is being held around disk and network I.O. Um, how much network I.O. are we doing? Well, it's, it's very little. It's, it's going to turn out that we're only doing unidirectional broadcasts. It's not request response. And it's typically happening within the replica. Um, if we're lucky, then we don't even have to go outside of the, um, the local replica to, um, to do the, uh, 
the readcaster. Um, but there is a protocol for the special case where something fails and we do it. I'll come back to that. So um, what I'm trying to say is that the amount of, of IO, network IO that's, that's going to expand our contention footprint is, is normally pretty small. Compare that with two-phase commit. Um, if I understand two-phase commit correctly, then both the proposal phase and the acceptance phase of the, uh, the transaction um, are happening within the context of the locks. And those two phases involve, I think, two consensus rounds across the whole, the whole network, which you know, may be quite a, a high latency network. Um, does anybody know if this is right that there are like, two rounds of consensus inside of two phase commit? This was, I sort of gleaned this from an email from, from Alex Thompson that studying two phase commit deeply. Okay. Um, uh, another, another fact of this is that we can't really do much batching in two phase commit because um, this, yeah, so this is an interesting thing to think about in contrast to Calvin. In Calvin, you can batch things arbitrarily. It doesn't matter what the transactions um, are, are referencing. They can all reference the same rows if they, if they want. Um, but you can't do that in two-phase commit because you have to obtain the locks before you start this process of proposal and acceptance. Um, and so you couldn't actually obtain those locks if you had two transactions that wanted to write to the same row, for instance. So you can't batch what you can't lock. So that's that right there is an advantage that, that um, Kelvin has being able to batch up larger numbers of transactions. Okay, so remember there's this this piece called the executor, which is one uh, if we have n threads, then there's there's one executor per thread, so we would have, have n of them. Um, what its job is uh, so it, it does this more or less in order. It receives a transaction from the scheduler. The scheduler hands out transactions to the executors in some, in some way as soon as they're, they're ready to take on more work. Locks have already been obtained for T, so the scheduler doesn't have to think about locking. It just has to execute. So it reads all of the rows in the read set of T, does all the reads that it needs to do for T. It broadcasts those. Well, it does all the reads that we can we can do locally, of course. It broadcasts those to to the peers and receives the the analogous broadcasts from peers. And you just have to wait until there's enough um, you've read enough rows to uh, evaluate the transaction. So when that happens, you don't actually have to hear from the other node. Just just when there's enough data. Uh, when that happens, you you execute the logic of the transaction. And you perform whatever writes you need to the to the local node, and so you might finish quite a bit sooner than than the same transaction executing on another one. Um, however, the the logic within the transaction at this point has to be deterministic. You couldn't sort of fail depending on a random variable or looking at a clock or something like that. Um, the problem with that, of course, would be that. The, the transaction running on another N1 replica might make a difference if you flip the coin in a different way. So, so you, you can't have any non-deterministic logic, and that means that if you want to use any of this kind of stuff in your transaction, you have to sort of factor that out before the sequencer. And they actually, I think they actually have a way of taking a, a, a tra transaction and linking it with a version of random time that do nothing or something. So they actually do some, some serious work to make this happen automatically in one of the Kelvin implementations. Okay, so um, but the recasters are the subcomponent of the executor that coordinates the sharing of read results between the, the, the different um, nodes involved in the transaction. Um, the key difference between this and something like two-phase commit, this took me a long time to understand. I had to sort of bug Alex to explain it to me a couple of times. Um, it doesn't actually, unlike two-phase commit, it's not actually trying to get um, a yes-no decision from other, other peers. It's just receiving a row, a set of rows, and it only needs to receive rows from a subset of the peers. You only need to receive um, um, enough data to, to execute the transaction. I'll uh, show what that means in a second. But what this is going to, to mean for us is that the success of the commit 
is predicated on on data from the database. It's not predicated on some independent decisions made it, made by different actors in the system. Um, so let's take a look at what this this means in terms of a simple example. Um, so take a moment here to figure out what this is saying. So here's our transaction. It's a fairly simple thing that just reads from table A, row one, and there's a column called salary. We're going to abort the transaction if the salary is negative. And then we're going to go to another table, update some row in that table by incrementing a balance by the, the value that we read from the first table. Now table A and table B might be in different, different nodes. Um, so let's assume in this example that table A lives in the N1 nodes. So N1 in, in replica 1 and N1 in replica 2 both have table A, and B lives in the N2 nodes. So somehow we've got to get um, the read result from N1 to N2 so that we can actually see the transaction N2. Um, so this, this dotted line, that's the job of the, the readcaster. It shares that, um, that uh, one value. It knows that it is going to need that, so it just it just goes ahead and does it. Doesn't it doesn't wait for a request or anything like that. Um, there is a request response protocol here. If this network link is having trouble, N2 can time out and send a request to a different replica, which of course will take longer because it's probably farther away, and say, hey, I couldn't get get the data I needed from N1. Please send me. Um, the, uh, the read set from this transaction, and so then it can get that from somewhere else. Um, so when this completes, when N2 has received one of these two broadcasts, then committing it N2 is just a predicate in the data from N1 and the data from N2. It doesn't matter who sent you the data. Um, so does this make sense? So because the transactions are deterministic, every outcome on every node produces the same read and write set. The consequences to be done the top is read, execute, write. Right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Yeah, and, and that's why we have to, in order to, to have that property, that's why we have to break up certain transactions and see these dependent transactions and then do them optimistically. Um, so to compare that with two-phase commit, um, in Kalman, we, we can commit successfully at that node if some predicate, in, in this case, the predicate is just S is, is greater than zero. Um, if some predicate in the, in, the, in the data stored in the, the nodes is, is true. But in two-phase commit, we have to actually look at a predicate of four things. We have to get acts from all four nodes in the system and commit only if all four nodes have act the, the commit. So it's dependent on, on getting data uh, across more uh, links. Um, OK, yeah, so now we're going to get back to the discussion about what, what Calvin is doing with playing around with the ordering of transaction. So um, Calvin actually has a little less flexibility here, but it can do better than just executing a transaction in sequence, letting T1 run to completion, letting T2 run to completion, and so on. Um, so here's a simple example. Uh, where we have three transactions queued up. T1 is the first one in our ordering, T2 and T3. They're being fed into the scheduler, and the scheduler has to decide, can I hand these off to um, executors? Well, the scheduler checked with the log manager. I didn't write it in the slide, but it has the log manager, so it says, OK, it's a lock manager. So it says, OK, we try to lock these rows. That's fine. Then we try to lock these rows, um, and that's fine because these are destroyed sets. And so we can go ahead and assign T1 to one of the executor threads and T2 to the other one. So they can run concurrently because their their lock sets um, are destroyed. But then T3 will be blocked by while these are running. If there were another executor, we can not run T3 yet. Um, a slightly more interesting example. Um, in this case, um, T2 is blocked on T1 because they both uh, are trying to lock the same rows. I'm presuming there's a write lock or something. Um, but T3 is separate of those two. So we can reorder it without 
breaking the invariant of the lock manager. The lock manager just says, and this is why it was so important that the lock manager is by row. Um, the lock manager just says that uh, as long as we order the locks per row, um, we'll get the, the invariant that we want. So we can, we can do these locks um, and those locks, since these locks don't touch the same rows as the T2 locks. So, so we can do a little bit of reordering to move things uh, around to, to, uh, to get more concurrency. But here's the case where, where two-phase commit actually can do better than tell. Um, in this case, uh, we, might, we might notice that T2 is this huge transaction, and it's going to take a lot of disk I.O. to complete or something, so we don't want to do it yet. But T3 is really small. Even though T3 operates on some of the same rows, we can still reorder it ahead because there's no global ordering. There's no one to tell us that that's the wrong order. They just arrived in that order, and all we care about is equivalence to some serial order. Um, so that can really increase throughput if there's a slow disk, and um, because like this might be blocked on IO, um, or maybe we might be able to predict that it takes a long time to do the IO. Um, but the effect of this with with a system like two-phase commit is that the replicas can diverge because we've done T3 before T2, and T3 is actually doing something that conflicts with T2. So which one happens first actually really matters in this case. So we end up with, uh, we might end up with a different result than in a replica where we didn't do that reordering. So consistent replication. Um, so this is really one of the cool things about Calvin, is that even with all the consistency of reordering we're doing, because we have this invariant on the lock manager, and because that gives us the invariant on, um, on the, uh, well, what, what it gives us is this. It gives us that um, if all transactions up to the nth have executed in R1, N1, and if all transactions up to N have executed in R2, N1, then the state of those two nodes is actually going to be known. Now, at any particular point in clock time, they may not have executed the same transactions, but eventually they will. And uh, so at, at that point, then, um, they always stay close to being synchronized. Um, they always come back to being uh, in the same state. But with two-phase commit, um, that isn't going to happen. Um, and so that's led to a, a bunch of different uh, attempts to fix that, like like on a, you have a master, and you keep a log of everything you did on the master, and then you send that master to the other nodes. Or there's some other alternatives, like um, uh, yeah, actually, I, I forget what the other ones are. Um, One question on yeah is what is the mechanism that stops two nodes getting too far ahead of or diverging like too much? That would be the question. Let's right. say you you have a piece of plug that just runs yeah. twice as fast. Oh, well, that would be what bounded what's by... What's bounded then? That would be bounded by, by the fact that things are being batched up every 10 milliseconds. So we have to wait for your basically... Yeah, you could never get ahead of that. Yeah, but you could have a node that, like if we've got a really s slow network, and the requests are getting queued up, and the node just couldn't catch up. And that is really <laughs> totally not yeah. um, But you, you would have the guarantee that if it did catch up to N, that it would agree with where the other node was at, if that helps. <laughs> Oh, okay, so this gets back to uh, the idea of dependent transactions. Um, uh, so the lock manager, remember the lock manager runs before we actually execute the transaction. And so um, if, we, and, it, and it needs to know what um, read and write what the read and write rows of the transaction are. Well, what if there's a transaction that dynamically determines what rows it's going to read and write? So um, in this case, we read, this is a very typical way this can happen. We read from a secondary index, we get a row ID, and then we go to the, the primary index and we update some, uh, some column on the primary index. Um, Um, so that's called a dependent transaction of order one because 
there's a there's a chain of one step, but there could be more chains. You could have a, an nth order dependent transaction too. Um, so what Calvin has to do here is to split this one transaction into two transactions, one in which we perform the read, and then the result of the trans transaction has that row ID, and then we just literalize that row ID in a second transaction. However, the second transaction can't just do the update. Update. The second transaction has to check that nothing has changed between those two transactions. So this is why it's optimistic. Um, and and uh, of course, this opens you up to the possibility of, um, of contention. If there's a really high contention for that particular row, then uh, T2 might fail even though T1 succeeded. Yeah, so instead of doing a blind loop in store, you're doing the cats. Yeah. 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 So this is really, yeah, the coherent swap kind of operation. Um, Uh, so how can how can Calvin fail? Um, so this is really a, where a lot of the the, um, the cost comes in. Um, we're using Zookeeper, and Zookeeper, of course, depends on having a form of nodes available. If we don't have that, then it won't run. Um, so it's no better than Zookeeper. Um, it can also fail in some other ways. For example, if every replica of a particular node is down. Then um, there's actually a there's a subtle difference here. It took, it took me a little while to understand the difference between these two cases. With a with a non-deterministic database, you can still run transactions that are disjoint from data in, in N2. That's that's fine. Um, in Calvin, though, you can't quite do that as well. Um, if a transaction needs to access that um, that rep replication group that's down, then um, it's blocked. And if some other transaction um, accesses a row that, that T0 um, uh, accesses, even if it's in a different node, then that transaction is blocked. And then anything else that has the same relationship to T1 is blocked, and so on. So it could propagate to a larger and larger set of rows that just prevent anything from making progress on, on those rows. So, so really, Calvin depends on having at least one replica of each node available at any time. So, so it has more, more points of failure than um, some other database systems. You can use v buckets to work around that. You can, you can use v buckets to work around that and reduce the failure by instead of sharding node 2 to node 2 across replica groups. You do double shard, and so you only share some rows with some diverse group of nodes in another region. So only rows in which all of the nodes that own that row are affected, instead of some large continuous group. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that like some sort of redundancy or something? It's just double sharding the data so that you don't end up with hotspots in the cluster where they share the bulk. Yeah. But you could have multiple replicas in group we just Yeah, you could do that just just for redundancy. Yeah, I think they actually suggest that in one of the papers. That's a good way to, if you can afford it. Um, so there's there's some other benefits that fall out of all of the, um, the design decisions in Calvin. Uh, since we're we're able to determine read write read write sets long in advance, in fact, just at the at the moment that a transaction hits the sequencer when it's first ingested into the system. Um, we could actually take that information and send it way downstream, and that may be like 500 milliseconds downstream because we have to get through all of the, uh, the, the epoch and the log and the meta log, and if that's going around the wide area network, that, that could take quite a lot of uh, time. So we can send that information downstream and tell the uh, storage manager on each node that 
these these uh, rows are likely to be rather written in the near future. So they could um, pre-warm the cache. Um, uh, it also makes this easier. It makes it easier to recover a node because we have this agreed upon log of transactions, and you can just replay that log to get either from the initial state to the current state or from some checkpoint up to the current state. Um, and the additional thing that's kind of cool is that if you want to do a read only query, you can just talk to any node in any replica uh, if the node has your data. It's the right node in that replica. Um, and, and you get consistent results because of the. Um, the, the determinism uh, invariant. Um, OK, so um, any questions on the first batch of the slide? Yeah. So <laughs> if you, the, the dependent transaction is, um, would it be possible to have two, like query A and query B, and they're both two steps? Um, the, they're, they're optimistic, right? So they can get invalidated and have to retry. Could you end up in a situation where A was invalidating B and B was invalidating A, so neither of them ever terminated it because this would, would start and then it would make this one retry, and it would retry, which would make this one retry, and then back and forth, back and forth. Um, well, the, the, the T1 in each, the A1 and the B1, in that would, they're just read transactions, so they couldn't. They're always read transactions. Yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you can never, like the, all writes always happen in the last step. So you have read, 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 write. You right. never have read, read, write. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so each step is just doing enough reads so that we can figure out the the row IDs or whatever. So we can do the next set of reads. So we can figure out the row IDs. So we can do the next set of reads, and so on. So even if it's a chain of n dependencies, each step in the chain that we break it out into is just going to do an additional set of reads. And then finally, we're going to know exactly which rows are really the ones that we're writing to. Then that'll be the last uh, transaction in the set. So I don't think that can that can happen. Because there's always exactly one. There's always exactly one update. It's always at the end. Yeah. Right. Well, it, it could be multiple updates within one transaction. Yeah, it's right. one transaction. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. Um, I won't talk too long about this. Uh, this is just this little project I've been working on to help learn uh, um, Calvin. So Calvin, Spinoza, um, trying to figure out what that gesture means. I don't know. <laughs> All my data is consistent. So. Uh, so why am I doing this? Um, it's a learning experience. Um, it's not really for analysis of correct or performance. Uh, we are explicitly modeling latency, so you could measure the effect of latency on, uh, on throughput in some cases. Um, really, I just wanted to be able to do some unit tests to set up some corner cases and see if it behaved in the way I, I expected. Um, so let me describe the model a bit. We're modeling many, many nodes of processes, just like we've been talking about. Um, networks have a latency. Uh, we're modeling all the underlying system software. We're not actually implementing this. Just it's just basically uh, um, uh, it's not actually doing anything except giving your data back to you after a delay. For example. Um, so we're modeling the log of the metalog, and the model includes how long it takes for a piece of data to become durable or to reach a quorum of the metalog, and how long it takes for it the data. Um, fully replicated. Um, we're modeling time as just a timeline of instantaneous events, and currency is just interleaving events on the timeline. And the way you make time elapse, for example, when you want to put something into the log and say it'll become durable after 500 milliseconds, the way you make time elapse is just schedule something for 500 milliseconds later, and then eventually that'll get executed. Um, and the implementation is just all within one thread, so it gives us a deterministic and omniscient view of this whole distributed system. So it's, it's very easy to, to, um, to inspect and, and observe the behavior. Um, uh, the underlying data store is SQLite in memory and uh, Ruby. Uh, kind of cool thing is that we use red black trees for the, uh, 
for the schedule of future events and for the history of past events. And that's how we can uh, do unit tests to say that a certain thing happened in a certain time range. And so if you want to take a look, there it is. And that's, that's it. No, no. I, um, I think I got hooked by one of Daniel Abadi's essays, yeah. and I realized that that this idea of taking asset transactions but then adding this extra invariant to it was actually very close to what I was trying to do with implementing some tuple spaces. Um, so I was glad to see that, that somebody had already done that those ideas and they had done a better job of making it distributed than I was doing. So. I, so um, yeah, kind of gratifying to, to see that happen. In the papers, the author, like, the authors the mentioned that they're going to want to make it open source and everything else, and they seem to have like very, very grandiose plans about what they want this to be. Well, I don't know. I mean, um, uh, Alex Thompson, I think he works at Google now, so he's probably working on something else, yeah. Whatever. Spanner, yeah. <laughs> Spanner 2 or something, I don't know. From the outside, you think that they were pitching it. I said, like, the thing that you could put on top of any data store that would handle this for you. But then from the other paper where the guy was already at Google, then it turned out to be like, the, we can make this data store turn into other data stores. Like, it can be a replicate store. It can be a like this. You can change these parameters. Right. There's, there's a lot of parameters. There's a lot of modularity. Yeah. Um, you can you can run it with with in-memory databases. You can use different lock managers. It, it's kind of cool that um, a lot of problems that sort of had been tried to solve, like like make the lock manager modular and separate it from the storage system, and you know make all these different parts actually replaceable. Those have been tried in, in databases before, but somehow these these new assumptions that they made about the, the linearization of transaction order and, and so on made it easier to do this. Um, so I, I really haven't focused on all the other choices from this, you know, pick one, column A, column B, yeah. column C. I've only really focused on the one where you use the um, the full uh, Paxos kind of implementation for the meta log rather than some of the other possibilities. Yeah. Um, uh, there's another. Oh yeah, another thing is how do you do your transactions? Um, uh, I've always just sort of worked with their idea of the. Um, um, well, they, they have a couple alternatives. One is to have um, like Lua transactions, where yes. they're, they're actually just you know, uh, Lua yeah. yeah. Um, there was something else that they did. There was another alternative for transactions. So maybe it was for procedure or something. Yes, it was for procedure yeah. and then another one. Yeah. And, and the optimistic concurrency. Notice there's no legacy figures published in the paper. Yeah. 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 I think they have something. Yeah, I think they have something in the, in the main one. I think it, yeah, they. It's Kyle, they have a checkpoint game. They have some number on, based on machines and. and you know what, actually, and, and like, it looks like 500 milliseconds minimum is a, a big, big number. They call it a micro benchmark, so yeah. probably it's not. Like, they have some numbers, but they don't really. I think the, the 500 millisecond one was for um, three widely distributed data centers. So, yeah, there's a lot of things. Like, and you should see like, the multiple hops, right? So, you, you do the digital persistence to your AP store for the log, right? So, that's at least one hop and probably two. And then you've got the access round commits, that's one round. And you've got another round for the block manager. You have no right. Oh, so that's not a lot of magic. So the one way to magic gets. Yeah, one round for the initial log. And then both of them. And if you're going from Ireland to Singapore, it's 500 milliseconds. It seems pretty fast. So, yeah, they recognize this and they realize that you're never really going to get great latency on your transactions this way, but at least with batching, you can see. 
struck by how similar it is to SMP techniques in hardware. I think you're using the, the readcaster for read ahead. Uh, things like uh, the consensus algorithm is the cache coherence box, basically. There's a lot of parallels to it. Yeah. It's, it's a microprocessor on a global scale. Yeah, really big. Yeah. Multiple processors. Well. And the data flow analysis to determine concurrency of transactions is exactly the same as atomics and multiple. Right, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you.